Welcome to the Habits and Hustle podcast, a podcast that uncovers the rituals, unspoken habits, and mindsets of extraordinary people. A podcast powered by Habit Nest. Now here's your host, Jennifer Cohen. All right, you guys, welcome to Habits and Hustle. Um, I, uh, I really like this guest we have today. <laughs> she is a true badass, a real boss. Her name is Cindy Eckert, and she is a woman who not just sold one company, but sold two companies, one for, I don't know, a billion dollars, <laughs> and it's another one for half a billion. Oh, I get that one. The billion's better. Oh, the billion's <laughs> way better. But still, like, I thought like that was like the big thing, and then you're like, oh, no, actually, I sold a company before that for a half a billion. So, you you know, besides wanting a loan from you. Yeah. Um, wow, that's the pink ceiling. We'll talk about that. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. Yeah. Exactly. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so listen, where do we start? So what, what Cindy, besides, the, well, not even besides, Cindy created what is considered the first of ever uh, female Viagra. That's right. Right. So it's not, it doesn't work like a, like a Viagra Correct. would. That's right. But the fact that she was the first person ever to create um, a, a medication, a pill that for women. And I think that's so it, it's not only is it interesting because usually people think of men in that, in that space, yeah. but you saw a real need biologically yeah. for yeah. women. No, I, there were, and by the way, when I started, there were 25 drugs for some form of male sexual dysfunction and not a single one for women. And I mean, you can just look at those numbers and know that that doesn't add up. Right. Women are equally affected by things, actually more affected than men by things going wrong in the bedroom, and yet we were running away and not addressing it. Why do you think that is? Is there, is there shame behind it or what? I think probably among us as women, we don't talk about it. There probably is a, a shame factor, a feeling very alone in what we're experiencing. I think if I elevate that to sort of societally, we value sexual pleasure for men and we dismiss it for women. So right. I'll tell you that in more simple terms. If something goes wrong for a guy, we go, oh, biology. And we rush in and we figure out how to fix it. If something goes wrong for women, we go, oh, psychology. And we pat her on the shoulder and tell her to take a bubble bath. And what we're doing is so grossly oversimplifying it, um, especially when it comes to sex, right? Yeah. Sex has psychology at play for sure, like how we feel about our body, how we feel in the relationship. but. Man or woman, biology is at play, and that's what really ignited me, is we had all this great science, but we were ignoring it because of our sort of belief system, if you will, about whether or not female sexual pleasure matters. You know, it's amazing, uh, besides a lot of things with you, but uh, the fact that it was a very difficult process. It oh, wasn't yeah. like, oh yeah, you know, I thought of this idea and it was easy to kind of execute on. Oh no. Walk, walk, it's, <laughs> it, it, like, walk me through, yeah. uh, like, how difficult it was to get it approved by the FDA yeah. and the process. Okay, so I'll make it really simple. So I'll okay. say, what if my pill had been blue? We all know about the little blue pill. Mm -hmm. I created the little pink pill. So with the little blue pill, the FDA considered it met such an important unmet medical need. It was so important that men weren't getting erections that they rushed it through approval in six months. It took me six years. I had three times as many patients worth of scientific data. Just think about that for a second, the disparity. So the same number of women feel like they've kind of lost their desire for sex. They were happy with it at one point. It's sort of gone away. That's causing them, they're, they're bothered by it. They mm -hmm. want to do something about it. That prevalence is the same as men as ha who have ED, but look at how differently we treated it. And the process was eye-opening for me because I actually came to this having run one of those companies with one of the male sexual health drugs. So I knew what the path looked like uh, and it's science, right? It's placebo control, blinded studies, you have to meet outcomes that are specified by the FDA. And we did all that work and we met all the outcomes, but they turned me down. Why? Why do you think they turned you down? Honestly, um, everything in medicine comes down to risk and benefit, mm -hmm. right? And it feels very objective. But the truth is, it's totally subjective. And if we assign no value to the benefit of something, then we won't take any of the rest of it seriously. And we, honest to God, we were making a value judgment about whether or not it mattered. People have said to me a million times, okay, Cindy, come on. Like, you're such a crusader here. Nobody's gonna lose their life from this. And my answer is simple. Go talk to them, go talk to those women because they're losing their life as they know it. 
They feel right. worse about themselves. They've lost some of that moxie, that sexual power that we have and bring into this world. And frankly, so many of them were losing relationships over it. Now, so for, for you to start the process and, and to even do this, were, if you don't mind me asking, were you somebody that was affected by this? Like, what, yeah. why, what made you decide that you're going to be yeah. the pioneer to do this? You know, I, I, I was in a sexless marriage at the time. Okay. And I think it was made me deeply empathetic to listen to women with this condition. The truth at the heart of it is I was just ignited by the injustice as just a geeky sort of science lover, first right. of all. Like, we knew from brain scan studies that there was a biological basis for some women and we're not doing anything about it. That probably was the biggest injustice. But once I really understood the scientific you know, um, discovery here, I spent a year just talking to women. And I think I could relate. I could relate to you know, how alone you feel in this, how you don't bring it up, you're embarrassed to bring it up, maybe with your doctor or even your girlfriends. And it's ridiculous because this is a medical, it's actually a medical condition that has been characterized since the 70s. This has been in the medical literature and a diagnosis for decades, and yet we've never given women a solution for it. So I'm just gonna ask the most you know, basic question here. Like some, sometimes people would think, well, cause it's, it's, I think it's mental for women, right? What, what turns a woman, woman on is very different than what turns a guy on, right? Guys are all about visual, women yep. are all about like the, the mental part. Sometimes people say, well, maybe the girl, maybe she's just not attracted to the guy for yep. all sorts of other emotional reasons, yep. right? So when you do a brain scan on somebody, how yeah. would you do it to know how accurate, yeah. accurate it is? So, so what you do is, yeah. it, the, basically what you're seeing is you're taking a woman who says, you know what, I, like, I love my partner. I once mm -hmm. was interested in having sex with them. It's like the switch went off. I never think about it anymore. When I lie in bed, I do my to-do list. Right. Like sexual thoughts are not, are not there anymore. And they're really bothered by it and want to do something about it. Okay, so that's sort of, I've described who this patient type is. Put her in an MRI. Put a woman who, you know, desire is not constantly on. It ebbs and flows. Right. But she's happy with where she's at. Expose them both to erotic stimuli, things that would turn them on. Brains light up totally differently. Really? Totally. To so radically differently. And I think what you're seeing there is we're quite animalistic when we have sex mm -hmm. i like to describe as we like shut down all the tabs in our brain right, right. to enjoy the experience and what you're really seeing on those images is that women who are struggling with this biologically can't quiet the mind and it's why they never fantasize anymore they never they might never have been initiators but they don't even respond to partners when you know they're sort of nudging them and interested in having sex no matter how they're, how how they think they're attracted to them totally. or not. Totally, this is the story I hear over and over again, and it's so sad. I, I'll tell a story. I got off a stage. I gave a speech, um, not that long ago. I was talking about this, and a woman like beelined for me, mm -hmm. and she came over and she said, "I heard you on a podcast." She said, "My husband and I were already with divorce attorneys," and she said, "And it was this is what started it. Like sex. Once you know, once it." leaves the bedroom, it spills over to the breakfast table. Like communication breaks down, it becomes all these resentments in the relationship, but sex had started it. She, was ne she never wanted it. And she said, I was sitting in my car and I thought, what if it's this? Nobody's ever told me mm -hmm. that it's possible that this could be something outside of my control, a brain chemistry issue. And she went to her physician, she was diagnosed. She went on the product and she said, can I take a picture with you? I wanna show my husband and we're still together. That is, I hear that story constantly. And what her husband was experiencing was, you're not attracted to me anymore. You don't find me sexy. She said he went to the gym every day. He was trying everything. And she was saying, no, but I find you sexy. But I, I do. I just don't ever think about sex. I hear this story every single day of my life. And I consider it just such a disservice to all those women that we don't tell them there's a possibility that they could, a possible, and by the way, proven right, right, way right. to address it. Okay, so then, you're because I remember you saying, I mean, even last night at the dinner, you yeah. said there's a particular personality type yeah. that tend to have this issue. Yeah. More classically type yeah. A. Yeah. More classically type A, and, and the reason I say that is that brain center mm -hmm. that we're looking at is the information processing center of the brain. Type A's are, they're going, right? Yeah. They have like a very highly developed, um, and they can't, quiet the brain down. 
So I often will see, and it, it really is women who have the condition, even if they don't know that there's a name for it. Right, right, so right. They describe it like incredibly similar, right? All of them. And they talk about lying in bed, doing their to-do list. Right. And actually, if they have success on Addy, what they then say is, oh my God, like I had a fantasy. I can't remember the last time I had a fantasy. And I think what that's telling you is how truly wired we are mm-hmm. to want sex. But your brain can sort of turn off on you. Right. And you're no longer even having those thoughts. So they'll say, oh, I was like driving in my car and I sent a little sex in the middle of the day. And, you know, I can't remember the last time I did that. So how does it, minis- how does it work? <laughs> like, does it turn Does it turn on a, syn- a neurosynapsis? Does it turn off a neurosynapsis? It, it basically works on the balance between serotonin and dopamine. Okay. So dopamine is excitement, like the excitatory factor for sex. And serotonin inhibits us. It's why actually a lot of us know antidepressants or maybe on them. Um, the number one side effect is it kills your sex drive. And that's because right. of what it's doing with serotonin. It's further inhibiting you. So the way that Addy works is we believe on that sort of balance, uh, basically between those two factors to have a pro-sexual effect. Wow. Okay. So, <laughs> that's, so a, that, that's very scientific, more or less like the positives on the positives for sex and the negative and the negative on the negatives for sex. You know, what's ironic is that if you were having more sex, maybe you'd be off of those antidepressants and well, and all those other medications, right? Because they would to increase your you, do- dopamine. A lot of times I do feel like when women have broached this conversation right. and, you know, before there was an option for women, Not surprising that a lot of people tried to give them that to sort of improve their mood. If you aren't having sex and you don't care, never take anything for it, right? Right, The hallmark characteristic of this is they're really very distressed over it. And so you can imagine when that distress shows up in the office, sometimes people just try to treat it like mood. You know, like, oh, well, if I can just give you this, well, then you'll be more interested. And actually, you're further compounding the issue. Right, right. So then, how does it, if, so like from what I remember from here, right, from my friends, not from anyone in my own life, guys, so I don't want <laughs> yeah. anything, but like if you take, if, if, if you are, if you pop a Viagra, it works for a finite period of time, right? For like six hours. <laughs> yeah. Or, Four hours. You're saying we all know the famous commercial line, right? right, right. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> the erection for four to six hours, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. And you basically it, you don't work like that, right? No, like, it's not that's like right. it's not for like this. You take this medication and you're like basically horny for like four hours. No, right. It's not like that. It's okay. really, it's much more. I, I hate to call it, it's not an antidepressant, but it's much more similar in that you take it daily. Right. It returns you to a baseline that you once knew, and you're sort of. You know, it's like on board for when the moment is right, so right. to speak. Um, but, you know, Viagra, it is an important contrast because so much of the media calls us female Viagra. Yeah. Which contextually I get. It's like the same kind of game changer for women. It's a way to explain it, right? right? Yeah. But it's not at all how it works. Viagra, Cialis, that's directed blood flow. That's a mechanical lift. That's hydraulic lift, right? Right. Oh, um, in yeah. a very directed way. What's so interesting, though is like, imagine that's not desire. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if a man had no interest, he won't get an erection on one of those pills. Desire is what starts the party for us, right? The interest in having sex. When we study sex and women, we look at- Oh, sorry, so hold on. So you're saying that if a guy isn't, if he doesn't desire you, whatever, the the erection won't even happen. Uh -uh. Desire is what kicks off this, the party for sex. A hundred percent, you gotta want, like, it's, you know, this cascade effect, in essence, like if you study the model, yeah. it's hopefully for women, desire, arousal, orgasm. And we look at pain factors for women, too, that there's no pain present. But that's kind of the continuum, if you will, um, of sex. So then do you go on this medication? It's called Addy. Uh, for those of you who, who may <laughs> want to try it. Uh, for like, is it like lo- you can go on for as long? No, but for as long as you, is it yeah. a finite period of time, like three months you get off? Like, do you cycle it? I, or you no, want it all the time? I think what will happen in real world is women will, depending on sort of stage of life or where they're at, like, I don't know how long they'll stay on it. What I do know is um, if you go off of it, your symptoms do return. So you can't mm-hmm. reset, mm-hmm. if you will. It's sort of a pink pill a day keeps this issue at bay, we like <laughs> to say, right? Um, and that's, um, that's, the, that's the truth of you need to kind of stand it, not unlike, again, those products that work on brain chemistry, 
the antidepressants right. are the one that most of us kind of understand because they've been around for so long. You need to take them daily. Right. So what about like, I'm just going to play devil's advocate, right? Please like hormones, right? Yeah. So people like have lots of different hormonal imbalances besides yeah. just saying for, for depression, whatever, yeah, like yeah. if you're aging, if you just had a kid yep. and so therefore your hormones are all out of whack. Yeah. When do you know again, if it's hormonal yeah. or when it's just lack of desire or just like you're biologically not, is it because at some point, this is where I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Like you were saying that type A personality is yeah. much more likely to have it. Does that mean that throughout their life they've always been a certain way, or are you all, or is it also you can evolve? Yeah, to have this issue. So I'll say if if your entire life you've never had any interest in having sex, and that's this is where the Addy comes in. No, oh. it's different. I I would say I I would say you that that's worth a further exploration. I think really this condition they were once happy it has changed. And I think in a workup with a physician, they might look at hormones mm -hmm. if appropriate. What's truly happened is a lot of women have received testosterone in an attempt basically mm. to, before there That's was true. anything you know validated, FDA approved, um, people were using testosterone off-label in women. They're using it now. They, they still do, yeah. correct. All and, the time. And what I'll tell you is, yes, I think postmenopausally we can look at what that sort of effect is. But the notion, and I used to sell a testosterone for men that I know people used off-label in women. And um, and I think that we're masculinizing in essence, and it doesn't come without side effect, right? It comes with deepening of voice, facial hair, all of those things are, are testosterone related. And so what I would say is desire, we know is really in the brain. Mm -hmm. That's how you would address it. I'm not saying you don't look at the hormone complex, but even for a lot of women where they've had a baby, their hormones have normalized. They say, but wait a minute, I still, I don't have any sex drive anymore. And I'm not talking immediately following baby. I'm it, talking, you know, a couple years later and the hormones are where they should be by all the studies, but this has been knocked off of kilter. Well, I've got two things I'm curious about because what happens in life, right? Like I've got two kids. Every, a lot of people, yeah. when you turn a certain age in life, you have like life issues of and stress. Like you have kids to deal with, yeah. you've got work to deal with, you've got aging parents, you've got yeah. so many different, you know, things to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Can that not play a part in someone's sex drive? Verse, hundred percent. Right? So I guess I get conf I'm getting, I get confused. Like when do you know if it's circumstantial? Yeah, sure. Versus biological. Here's a good litmus test. If okay. you have no sex drive in LA, you're busy, you're on a deadline, the kids are crying mm -hmm. in the room next door, but you go on vacation to London and you're like, baby, let's go. Probably not you. That's situational, right? So if you can remove yes. sort of the no time, no stress, no energy, I will tell you though, for millions of women, by all of the data around the globe, it would be a luxury to say, honey, not tonight. It's right. not about no time, no energy, no privacy. That's not what it is. It's that a switch, if you will, has been turned off and they don't get there even when they've removed all of those stressors. I wonder if it's also like, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it type of thing, right? Yeah. You get so used to being in a certain kind of cycle in life yeah. that eventually it becomes dull, right? Yeah. So you want to like reignite something. Maybe the, maybe I would imagine like if once you take, take Addy yeah. or whatever, you're, even though you're saying you have to take it to, to make it active all the time, yeah. it's still like once you start doing something, it's easier to keep uh, on doing yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, there's a beautiful marriage here of medication that sort of is an intervention biologically to something going on. And even the, you know, therapy angle, like I think this is a beautiful compliment mm -hmm. because let's be honest, if you haven't wanted sex for years, mm -hmm. you've developed a dance in your relationship already. Right. You go to bed earlier, you avoid those things. I mean, this is what, like, there's a lot of avoidance behavior. And like, once you get on this, if the spark reignites, your partner may still not initiate because yeah. they're so used to being turned down that you can really, like, you can, I think, retrain that in a really comprehensive way by using both approaches. Um, but, you know, there's, let's just say it did reignite and you got into a new sort of pattern set. And then you went off of it. Good, like I love that. Bravo right? to you. I love that. Like I love that notion right. that it would get you back into, if you will, that routine because something helped get you there. Right. So, are, do you take it then? I do. 
You do take. I yeah. guess you have to say that though. Right? I do. No, no, I, I, don't I, need will, it, I, guess. I will tell you very honestly, like yeah. I'm often um, very cautious about saying that because I don't want anybody to assume like, you know, what it has done for me will be identical right. to what it does for them. So I'm very careful about, you know, this is no like testimonial, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a reason I was such a crusader for this to get it say, through. Like um, that's what I was saying yeah. earlier, you had to have had some kind of like personal, like effect of it for sure right no no doubt about it and i i do say you know with this there's no such thing as you know a one size fits all panacea like there's no in any medication right by the way nothing is one size fits all it has you know it has upsides it has downsides there are risks to all things you take including things over the counter right um so you really do need to make this decision with your healthcare practitioner what is a side effect that can do have side effects yeah. okay so um the the top three are dizziness nausea and sleepiness um sleepiness we dose the uh, addy at bedtime so intentionally take it right oh, before you good. go to bed yeah, <laughs> you can work as an ambient too. <laughs> yeah, that's we we get we get a lot of that uh, reported right for a lot of women yeah. who are on sleep medications too, like having that uh, benefit. Wow. Women tend to stop sleeping well as they age. Well, wow. it's, 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 there's so many issues as you age, right? Yeah. Like it's that's why it's like you never you can't tell what is what. Like if it's a hormonal thing, is it a circumstance thing? That's yeah. why. It's, that's why I was asking you about your medication yeah. and like a hormonal thing. Then, okay, I, I know also like some people take have taken, not me, so I don't want to be, but <laughs> women have tried taking Viagra. Yeah. Okay. And if it's just a blood rusher to, yeah. the, to mm -hmm. the penis, then <laughs> why, okay, what happens to a woman when they take, well, it works. People oh. like, or I think it works. People say it works. It doesn't work. Dana, I have no idea. I'm, I'm just guessing from here. A, from like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I have pure, no idea. like purist on like what is the scientific data yeah, has no, it been no shown idea. in like a, a placebo controlled trial? Um, I think the only thing you could affect is again, it's not igniting like desire, desire yeah, or your exactly. libido. Um, it would just be directing blood flow and causing some engorgement. So maybe um, it's placebo. I think it's placebo though, right? Because people don't know that. Yeah. So I mean, I've, I've had friends, like not close friends, but people are like, oh yeah, we, I, I went on by, I tried it. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, it was great. But I think it's also like the placebo effect. Then, they right? might have had, look, they're, they might have had more blood flow. They might have had whatever that may have been. I mean, I think that could happen. I think, yeah. But I don't think it made them want it. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, really, if you look at this field and one of the things that, again, really motivated me when I went through it is it's not like in the absence of treatment, women haven't been seeking treatment. Right. It's why they're taking something like Viagra that hasn't been proven, right, to be effective for women. More recreational, or, probably. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think there's so much, unfortunately, like, I want to call it pseudo pseudoscience out there, like all these BS um, you know, take this, take a tra take tree bark, and it's just not scientifically proven. Right. And for me, um, it's not that I don't want women to have access to lots of options, but I want them to have access to real scientific options. Right. And we need to fix that in women's health. Four percent of all research dollars go to women's health. Four. I know it's like, so that's crazy. That's ridiculous. I know it is actually. It's crazy. <laughs> and then, so what? Do you have like a percent, like a statistic, like? You take Addy and your sex drive goes up 50%, yeah. 80%. Yeah. What is it? 80% more desire. 80% more. 80, 58% uh, more satisfying sexual events and 75% less distress. And those are all measured by scientific instruments. It's called the Female Sexual Function Index is one of them. Female Sexual Distress Scale. So these are instruments we've used scientifically for years. Based on how many people? Uh, we had, we had 13,000 women total in our trials. We're the largest ever new drug application for women. I'm really proud of our That's science. That's amazing. I'll give you context. The average new drug in the U.S. is approved on um, just under 800 patients. We have 13,000 patients. Now, I will say that includes rare diseases. So there's some where the population size is small. But even like a Viagra, 3,000 patients. Really? So just imagine that data set um, is, a, is a pretty extraordinary difference. So is a price point like any other medication then? Yes. Is insurance covering it? it? Yay! That was one of my crusades. You better believe it. For 20 years, we've covered Viagra Cialis for men. I wanted parity coverage for women. And 70% of the time, insurance covers this. Wow. We're, still, we're not at 100%. We may never get there. But I'm really damn proud of 70% of the time. So um, price, you can get started for free. 
So I, I want people to have access to be able to do it. Um, Zero dollars out of pocket. And then if your insurance covers it, 25 bucks, never more than 99 bucks until your insurer covers it. That's really amazing, Cindy. Yeah. So then, oh my God. So you, first of all, I don't even know where to begin to start with you because the, the billion dollars, the half a million billion dollars. <laughs> so what happened? Did you, you, did you sell this? I did. And then why are you still crusading? Oh. Like, so yeah. I what thought is, you sold it for a billion dollars. I did. Who did you sell it to? I sold it to a company called Valiant. Canadian company. <laughs> I was going to say, that sounds very familiar. Yeah, yeah. And if you follow this industry, they like had their own turmoil um, not long after they bought us. Like at the time they bought us, they were a darling on the stock market. I couldn't have picked a better partner. They were going to march it across the globe. They were going to make it affordable. We were 35 people when we crossed this finish line. And I love my team. Like they set out to change the conversation about women and sex. But when we got it approved, this is a drug for the world. This is a drug for the masses. And so three companies came come, came calling. They emerged the winner, importantly, because they were going to keep me and my team. And I know it always comes down to people right, and the passion always. and the drive for what we'd set out to do. And uh, unfortunately, their business went sideways. And in three months, my entire team was gone. And they put it on the shelf. And I was devastated. I mean, can you imagine we fought that hard? We went that long to finally get one for women. And then they couldn't get it. I mean, I went to the pharmacy wow. to get it, and I was told I couldn't get it. Are you kidding me? Um, so I fought them. Uh, I first asked them to give it back. I think they laughed in that yeah. conversation. So they and paid they you around a billion dollars. They had already paid it. Um, they, is it Canadian money, though? No, That's no. a 30% no. look. Okay. <laughs> it's U.S. Okay, U.S. U.S. cash. Okay. People say, was it stock cash? Cash. Wow. Um, so uh, they paid me the money. And, you know, look, as a founder, Oops. you kind of think, well, you know, it's so much my baby. It's so much part of me. You kind of have to sit on the sidelines. But when they got rid of me and all of my team, I knew nobody was going to champion it. I couldn't get it, even though I wanted it. And um, and so ultimately, I will tell you, from company number one to company number two, you get smarter along the way. I wrote a better contract. And when you write contracts, you know, often you get money up front and then you participate in royalties or milestones right. downstream. And so the first time I sold a business, I had these, um, you know, continuation of, of money, but it was based on a best efforts clause. What was that class, business, by the way? It was called Slate and it had a testosterone product. Okay, for men. so it was still in the same, in the it same. It was, in yeah, I've been okay. sexual medicine for years. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you got like a half a million for, I'm yeah. sorry, half a billion Over for time. that. Yeah. And so then I got the second, when I when I sold Sprout, as opposed to this like best efforts clause, because mm -hmm. you know my best efforts may be different than their best efforts. I um, I wrote really specific things for them to do, and they weren't incredible, right? They were how much money they'd spend on education, how many salespeople they'd have calling on physicians across the U.S. And when they did none of them, I sued them. Um, and in exchange for me dropping the lawsuit, they gave it back to me, but I kept the billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, that's, so now I have it back and we've launched it. Okay, I, first of all, what are you going to do with all this money? Are you like building uh, like houses with all this uh, money? Like with dollar well, I, bills? Well, I wish I kept all of it for myself. Like I had many investors, the so shareholders did really well too. But you know what I'm doing is putting my money where my mouth is. And I started the pink ceiling. And the pink ceiling is about really investing in game changing first for women. And often ideas that I think are catalysts in changing social conversation because I'm not letting anybody else go through the bullshit that I had to go through. No funding, um, you know, all of sort of the, the doubts along the way. And for me, nothing's more rewarding than helping these female founders. That's amazing. So how big is the fund? Um, so it's my money. Right. Um, it's not a fund. I'm it's not just... really, I'm an operator. So I'll tell you, it works a little differently than a fund. Um, so we find these incredible disruptors. That's who I'm looking for. These yeah. really disrupt. That's who I need to win. Right. right. I need these women doing these incredible things, taking big swings, who walk into the, you know, venture capital um, boardrooms and get laughed out of there. I need to help them get there. And so um, they get access to my business team who built uh, companies with me and me. And we really sort of ride alongside of them and help them get to the finish line. So there's no like there's no amount like you'll, whatever the if yeah. whatever the idea needs, you'll yeah. help. And we start, and we're really, we take really early bets on them. And what is, so it depends on the stage of the business. We've right. written, you know, multi-million dollar checks and we've written $50,000 checks. Like right. we're in a, in a big range based on the business need. Um, but I think the importance is that we really, 
I, I'm a built to sell kind of girl. I want to see women get to big outcomes like me. When I sold a business for a billion dollars, that should not be a lonely club. We should have a lot of people believing that women have the next billion dollar idea. And I think it, you know, even inside my group, this woman that's invented the first ever flushable pregnancy test, it's a hundred percent biodegradable. Wow, idea. It's totally like, you know, the conversation about discretion, she's dynamite and she'll completely disrupt the industry and somebody inevitably will buy her. How did you find her? How did she find you? She jumped in an Uber with me in DC <laughs> for real. Would, yeah, just, she just by just no, she, she knew, she, he, knew, she, knew she, she jumped in to pitch me. We were in an Uber pitch thing, and she <laughs> was like, You, you, because you, you know, you've done it with an FDA approved, you, you are a champion of these like scientific sort of breakthroughs. And so, I'm very fortunate I find these like incredible, I they're often geeky scientists or engineers. Yeah. Um, who find their way to my path, to my door, but they're awesome. So when is okay? So she didn't just like find you on the street and then jump into mm-hmm. your Uber. It was it was actually a pitch, a pitch in, yeah, like, in an Uber. It was with Uber, like the sponsor yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yes. Okay. And then when was that? Like a couple. Of- um, that was probably. I bet that was. I have to think about this. Twenty seventeen. Oh. So okay. we're we're three years in. She's gotten through the FDA. It's ready to go to market. So when does it's it go been, to market? Uh, we're working on that right now. So this fall. Wow. So how involved are you in these people's businesses? Are um, you like, is it because a lot of times people are like, yeah, they give, they, they, they write you a they, check and they, they don't they, help yeah, you. Exactly. Or they're very like, they're, they're very separate. Like they'll like yeah, yeah, get a yeah. couple calls on your behalf. That's classical. Yeah. So I think really sort of traditional fund. Yeah. You know, they're only going to be as good as what you ask mm-hmm. them to do. I'm not saying that they don't want to help you succeed, right. but like if you say, will you please introduce me to so-and-so and here's the email I'd like for you to send, they're likely to do that. We're like sleeves rolled up all in. We're really venture builders. Amazing. I mean, I go to the meetings with them. I help them often find manufacturers. I often, you know, I write the, I write big checks, but I also give them access to all the people who wrote checks to me uh, to bet on me through the years. And I say, hey, this is an idea I'm really excited about. I think you will be too. So I often help them get more money even outside of me. So it's really fun. How much did it take for you to get Addy off the ground? Like I know you have a lot of you had you had different investors, but yeah. how much did it cost? Hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars. Well, so you made a nine hundred million. That's, yeah. a, that's a that's a that's I actually a didn't win. spend fifty million of it, so I gave it back. So I only spent fifty million of that over the course of the time. And what is it? What does it go towards? Like the the clinical trials? Yeah, that is was that, the most that's expensive very, part. So expensive. Yeah. Every time, and you can imagine as I went through this process, and it was like I'd done all the work, I'd met all the endpoints, and I'd get a no. And it would be like the company was over, and I'd have to go raise another ten million dollars to do a single study. And everybody's going like, my odds are diminishing, right? Every yeah, time I get yeah. a door slammed in my face and I'm still having to go out and get money to keep going. Um, so it was a um, character building experience. Right? You, you, you know, it's funny though. It's not even funny. It's actually quite sad that to get through these clinical trials and the FDA is so much harder than anyone can ever imagine. It's so hard. I have a friend who created something that was extraordinary and it works yeah and spent again with investors and everything else and it's public 150 million dollars yeah and then the clinical trial what some what, one clinical trial yeah. didn't work to his advantage yeah, yeah. and the whole thing is gone yeah no it's, it's i mean it's unbelievable you're taking um it speaks a lot i think to my personality taking like oh. m- major swings at impossible odds because your odds there are really impossible and that's what we do at the pink ceiling too is take big swings at these game changers that have really, you know, difficult paths ahead. No, you like that's why you're just incredible because that's a very hard task to achieve. And then and then what happens? You now you lost a hundred million dollars. Yeah. What do you do then? That's right. What happens? I know. <laughs> like yeah. do you go I, yeah. that's yeah. And you spent like years of your life yeah, on this sure. thing. Like, I, I gotta tell you the, a story on that because the outcome was totally binary, right? Right. We were gonna win big or right. massively lose. And um, in the last kind of moment, as I'd gone through this crazy struggle and, you know, keep coming back, keep coming back with the FDA, is they held this big scientific meeting and they invited in all of these medical experts to basically review our data and get to ask us questions. And the night before we went there, and this was like our biggest moment ever, it was going to seal, they were going to decide at the end of that day what their recommendation was. I threw a victory party. And I know my, the chairman of my board was like, you're doing what? Like, shouldn't everybody be in bed early? Shouldn't you be? 
And I said, you know what, at this point, like we have left it all on the field. Like we've done everything that we could possibly do. Tomorrow is out of our hands. Like we know this. And so I think we walked into the room as champions and we walked out champions. This is so, you're so inspiring. Oh, thank you. No, really, it's amazing. And then, okay, so give me some other companies that you're working under. Yeah. It's called Pink Ceiling. Pink Ceiling. I call it the Pink Incubator. And you wear everything is pink. Your shoes are pink. Your shirt's pink. Last night I saw you wearing another pink outfit. That's right. Is it that you just love pink? I do love pink, but pink for me is in so many ways, it was the shift from underestimated to unapologetic. Oh, I love that. The pink was, you know, we have certain things we assign to pink, weakness, whatever. Um, I see it totally differently. I see your femininity as a huge strength, um, in, even in the boardroom. And so I fully embraced it and would show up at the FDA in blazing hot pink and wave from the audience because that's what we were going to talk about that day. Um, so in the so incubator, because of course, like we don't need any more incubators with like bros and hoodies and craft beer on tap. Right. So we have a beautiful pink office with rosé on tap. Do um, you? We do, yeah. Is this back in, in Raleigh? Raleigh? Yeah, it's so fun. Oh, that's so it's great. Such a great. And I have such a great, and you can imagine, very colorful team. I can um, imagine. But we have um, Leah Diagnostics with this flushable pregnancy test. I have a technology that if I dip my finger in this water and I touch this disc, it would tell me in 30 seconds if there was a date rape drug in that drink. I have that in college. Like when I found this, and actually it's so funny because when I found this, and it was invented actually in Raleigh um, by some students at NC State, and I thought they were sort of getting, people were being tough on them. They were saying, well, why should a woman have to do that? And I'm like, let's be real. Like I have nieces wow, yeah. in college right now. This is happening and this is a solution to that. So I love technologies like that that even push people outside of their comfort um, zone. Yeah, sometimes I think even unconscious, you know, bias in these circumstances. That's a great so, idea. I, who oh, thinks of on. these things? I know, right? And I would say sometimes like only a woman would think of it. Right. Like a flushable pregnancy test, only a woman would think about it who's had to like go into the bathroom and test at work and doesn't want to leave it in there. Absolutely. And you put you it know, into your purse. Like, yeah. Trying to find totally, a garbage like four blocks so away. That's so true. Um, so I have a great young engineer um, out of Texas. She runs a company called Intuitap, Jessica Traver. And she has what I call a stud finder for the spine. Like I'm, I'm truly oversimplifying it, but it's gonna change spinal taps, which are very commonplace oh in emergency rooms. And what we do is like, we feel around and we go, okay, and we put a needle in. I'm, I'm being a little, a little um, you know, cute about it, but not much different that that's the state of the art. And 60% of the time they get it wrong. Which, oh by the way, gosh. means it gets referred to radiology, which is a huge cost in the it's healthcare system. And she basically has created something that through heat mapping, it wow. finds exactly where it should go. It advances the needle in. She's going to revolutionize this and like a massive company will buy her. And yeah. what I love about these ideas and part of the reason I picked them, it's not that we couldn't go the distance and bring it to market and that's really fun, but I think they're massive ideas that big companies can come in and take and when those women get to those exits, we start to think differently about who has the next idea, mm -hmm. which I said, and you know, I know that when I walked into the room to pitch coming out with the first ever drug for women's you know, sexual pleasure, I was typically laughed out of the room. And what I love to do now is I love to call some of those guys and say, I just gave you a billion reasons why you better look at this. Yeah. And so you know what's God. great is, People are like, I hope you never let them in any of your deals. I'm like, no, no, I absolutely let them in my deals because that's how you change things. That's incredible. I'll go back to that thing that you're saying about that technology that you can see if there's a date rape drug in the. Yeah. The, so how did how does it work? It's on your phone or how? Does so it's a little disc. It's like a little plastic disc that you can stick on the back of your phone on a keychain. Oh, you just wow. have it discreetly. On and you. you put it on top of the glass? No, nope, you actually, you really do dip your finger and touch like just a, it only requires like a droplet of water. And in 30 seconds, it runs the test. Wow. I mean, for co for college use right now, oh I think that's God. so, these are amazing. Like, I would like to see, honestly, like I'd like to see an alcohol company start to give it out with their drinks. Because that's a good idea like too. alcohol is a social lubricant, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. Right. And like being able to be in front of that and saying like, hey, like we're part of the solution. And interestingly, even on college campuses, fraternities are really positive about this because they want to make sure it's given out at the yeah. party. Everyone is safe. 
it's really like a sign of, you know, none of us here tolerate that. These are brilliant ideas. I mean, so if a, if a guy came to the pink ceiling, yeah. would you take his idea? Yeah. If it's for women, 100%. So it doesn't matter who actually thought yeah. of the idea. That's right. But it has to be the, applied to the women. The technology for date rape was, was invented by a guy. Oh. Four guys. Students. Amazing. Yeah. These are these actually are great ideas. Thank you. How many other ones do you have? Um, my God, I could go on uh, for days. So we have about 12 under the uh, pink ceiling umbrella right now. And we're pretty selective because right. we're going to go the distance with them. Uh, but we're always hunting. I have a, a great new, and we got to talk about it. I won't talk too much about it and give it away, but a new breast cancer um, technology that I'm really excited about. We do. Okay. We have to definitely yeah. talk about it uh, offline. Uh, bless you over there. <laughs> <laughs> so... Wow. Okay. So then where do you, you, okay. I, I don't, I, so what do you, how do you have time? How, were you always <laughs> like this? Like, how did you, like, yeah. years back. Yeah. Okay. So you've been doing this for how long? When did this whole thing start um, for you? I have been, um, I started my first uh, business in 2005. Now, do you have so, a background in science or? Love it. Business. Uh, so study business, but fell in love with the science in this industry. Like just love the change you can make in people's lives. Don't necessarily love how the industry got it done. Right. Which is why I started, my first company was called Slate, which was entirely like clean slate. I'm doing this on my own terms. I love these, you know, these kind of great innovations that help a population and we can do it differently than big pharma. So before you did the, this, the first company that you sold for a half a billion, yeah. what were you, what, was that your first company? It was. So what did my you do first before? from scratch? Um, for, through the industry, like, you know, worked my way up. I started in sales. Where'd you um, go to college? I want to know everything to, about you. So I went to Marymount outside of DC. Okay. Uh, good Catholic, good, good Catholic school. Oh. Um, and you know, it's funny as part of the reason I went there is I had a really unusual childhood. I moved every year for, from the fourth grade through my senior year of high school. Oh. And I ended up my senior year of high school in DC. And my singular criteria for college is I am not leaving this area. Like I refuse to move again. Right. Isn't that funny? So much. Right. And I, I, I know like looking back, that was such a great preparation for what I would end up right. doing professionally. All of those moves and really, you know, having to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. And, 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 you, and you had to be. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to make friends every yeah. single year with yeah, different people, yeah, yeah. I guess you had to navigate yeah. really well. Yeah, I definitely wasn't going to be the cool Indeed. kid like showing up the first day of school, right? <laughs> right, right so you right. had to like work your way through that. And, and I think it, you know, created really independent thought, which is great. And my parents certainly did too, like push me to be an independent thinker. But also, you know, I got all this wonderful, like different perspective because I moved not only, you know, from city to city, but country to country over the course of that time. So I got these incredible experiences. Were you a good student? Yeah. You were a good I student. Was. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm pretty um, competitive. So were you always very, com that was just your nature, right? You I were am competitive. Yeah. I have yeah. two big brothers who probably um, instilled that in me, right? We always, like, we're always competing with each other in some kind of ridiculous, it might be a board game or whatever it is. Um, but they were good. They definitely did not get the memo that they were supposed to protect their <laughs> little sister. Uh, their version of that is we're going to like toughen you up for the world. And yeah. thank God they did. What, well, yeah, it worked. Yeah. Are they, are they, do they work for you now? Yeah, or? one of them okay, does. Yeah, one of them does. One of them was on my board. And you know, what's so funny is when I started this and I had to go out and raise money, and I thought, you know, I certainly had like a professional track record at that point, but I didn't have a Rolodex. I didn't have a rich uncle. Right. And I didn't have a Rolodex of anybody who's going to write me a check. So you better believe I went to my two big brothers and I was like, you have to write me a check. So they actually and helped And you know invest. what's funny is like they, they had little kids at the time. My nieces right. and nephews are older now. They don't really have a ton of money sitting around to do that. But God bless them. They wrote me a check. And now I like to say, aren't you glad I'm your little sister? They wrote, so they're the ones who actually helped invest yeah. you. Because this was like what you said 15 years yeah. ago. And you're not, you look pretty young to me. So this was, you must have been Thank pretty you. young when you started all of this. Thank you. Yeah. Youngish. I mean, you know, in the industry for a while, but um, yeah. Wow. Like young to, young to, certainly didn't look like the classical uh, pharma CEO. I love it when people uh, introduce and they'll say, you know, our next guest sold their last business for a billion dollars and, you know, the pharmaceutical company. And I come walking on stage and people are like, who's that? Like, we didn't see the woman in pink coming, exactly. right? Exactly, the pink tracks walking up to them. And that's good. I love it. I mean, and so how much did they give you initially to start this whole 
Um, you know, I should know the exact check size. It was um, it, it was less than five digits. I mean, it was you know just stuff to kind of get me started. But them betting on me and me being and I and I stalked people. I will say, like in the most professional yeah. way, like I had to figure out like who am I going to target? Who could write me a check? And you know, how do I get in a room with them? And when I got in the room with them, I would say, Hey, will you introduce me to three of your friends? And hey, will you introduce me to four of your friends? And and it's incredible when you look at um, just my investor group. Like I have an entire group of investors in Fort Worth, Texas. If I'm ever feeling down, I go to Fort Worth, Texas because they're the most incredible group. But it really grew because one person told three people who told. And that's how you've got to do it as an entrepreneur who doesn't have you know the privilege of the money already Family waiting money, for you yeah. to do it. Or you maybe didn't go to B school. I'm not. I didn't go to Harvard, you know, business school or anything else. You don't have that network. You gotta make your own network. Yeah, and that's you do. really part. It's at the time I think when I was having those doors slammed in my face, or I was being laughed out of the office. Um, you know, what feels like your curse really becomes your blessing mm-hmm. because all of these investors who came and bet on me hung with me. And I think Amazing. if I had gotten a very classical VC check up front, a big check, they would have run screaming the first time we hit uh, a road bump. So yeah, I mean, I, I also think that what you said is spot on. Like everyone should be a conduit to someone else. You yes. don't leave one meeting without getting another That's name right. or two names. For sure. I have always said that and I'm glad to hear that you yeah, also feel the same for way. Sure. What would you say your most, what's that one, one, if you could pick one quality about you besides doing that kind of thing yeah. that really kind of made you successful like this to this level? Tenacity tenacity. I just keep showing up. And I think that, um, you know, I've I've had a lot of critics. I've had a lot of people tell me I can't do it. And actually I've listened to them as much as I've listened to anybody else. It's like you take it at face value and you just keep showing up. I think if you, if that affects you in any way, you're not going to be able to push through. Yeah. And how how long were you married to your first husband? You said, um, we were, we were together for 10 years and, and uh, separated for part of that, but we were in a company together. So we had to manage that. We had to manage that dynamic. So there was no time to ever. I actually think it's incredible. So we met working together. I would tell you that we sort of mistook professional chemistry as personal chemistry. Mm -hmm. We were really good working together. We were terrible um, in a in a personal relationship. And I think once both of us realized that, we sort of kept the good Mm -hmm. and lost the rest, and were able to compartmentalize it. And you know, life is too short to be mad at at your exes. Right. I mean, well, I also find it interesting. I would I'd be curious because now you said you were engaged. Yeah. Has it been difficult to find oh a my guy? God. Because yeah, like, because can you just imagine I the can't. work that I do? I, I, I have told this story before, but I am telling you. So when I used to like get on an airplane and if there was a, a you know, nice guy like chat me up next to me, it would always inevitably go to, what do you do? And I would do this like, I'm in healthcare, like, I would be, <laughs> right? And, and eventually it would come out like uh, female Viagra and they would say, female Viagra? I'm female Viagra. Yeah, oh God. And I would, and I finally was like, okay, what's my response going to be? And I finally said, Hey man, if I had a nickel for every guy that told me that yeah. I would have had to sell the company for a billion dollars. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they stopped talking to me, but you no, know, I'm so lucky that I, I found this great, great guy. Cause I think it was complicated in the field that I was in. And, oh, well, and yeah. truthfully, like I was so, um, head down doing the work, uh, that I was, really focused on that more than I was on, on dating. And that's not necessarily good advice for anybody else, no, right? You should have this balance in your life. It's hard. Listen, you know what? That's, I think it's very unrealistic when people say that you could have it all oh, you right can't. now. It's bullshit. Sure. You, maybe you can have it all at different times of your yes, life. That's right. But you know, like you you're going to be sacrificing something absolutely. at every moment. Yes, absolutely. Depending and, on what's taking priority. And I think that like, it's a, it's a, that's a genuine comment to say, like you have yeah. to be where you are or yeah. to get to where you are. It takes a lot of tenacity and yeah. a lot of hard work yeah. and grind. Totally. And it's like, you just have to grind. Yeah. I mean, that's what it yeah. is. People think it's sexy. It's actually not that no. sexy, right? <laughs> it's like, you got to like grind. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and so the guy, your, your fiance, yeah. what does he do? He now? works with me. Oh, well, there to, you go. Do you know Again. what? I mean, Did not, not and truly like not, uh, not in the beginning, but, um, I think maybe to, to know me, uh, or to love but, me yeah. is to work with me. Cause that's what I love to do. Right. And it's certainly the people I'm connected with who have like, you know, yeah. big ideas. So he was an entrepreneur. He built his own business in tech. He sold it. Um, and you know, he uses an entirely different part of his brain than I do. Right. And he's such a 
an incredible like asset to me. So he gets to run in his whole own lane. I have no idea um, half the things ceiling? he's doing. So he works with me on that because he's he's been through the he's been through the wars, right? Like wow. he has gone and built it from scratch himself, and he understands for the digital space so much even better than I do. And he's really great for our founders. Oh, that's amazing. Plus, he's a character and a half. I, yeah. would, I would imagine yeah. you, would, you wouldn't be with anything besides <laughs> he that. Draw, he actually, he's he's a brilliant artist and just, he would save every animal in the world. We have pigs, we have chickens, we have rescue dogs. And, um, and he draws actually like on, you know, he does custom shoes, oh, like nice. custom shoe art. And he draws animals on shoes. It started just as kind of a fun thing. And it has exploded. And I tease him all the time on Instagram, like, Oh my God, your side hustle is becoming like the full-time thing. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Maybe you should invest in that That's company right, pink exactly. ceiling and make That's pink right. shoes That's for right. women. Exactly. So, okay. So I've been like, you're probably like getting super hot and sweaty on this oh, treadmill. I am. I'm like wondering why you're not sweating and I'm sweating so much. <laughs> this is like, this is like child's play for me. I'm at <laughs> 1.7. I'm used to it. I'm going to be on this thing for the four I, or five I don't hours know. today. Okay. Much you know? respect well, on listen, that one. I'm exa- believe me, I get, I get exhausted <laughs> by the third person after four hours of this. Let me tell you. Incredible. Um, so what are, what are your it's daily? Ha- it's well, it's, it's fun actually because yeah. it's like at least I'm moving. I'd rather move, yeah, and versus sit sedentary yeah, 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 for sure, and just like talk to people yeah, like yeah. Rah, rah. like I'd rather be like sure. doing this. Um, and also, it's great for your brain. It's better for your oh, cognitive functioning. Uh, listen, if I have an important flow. phone call, like I stand up. Like right. you, absolutely. I'm much more of like the pacer around the office. You're much more alert. For sure. When you're moving. Uh, okay, so now I've lost my train of thought with you, my dear, but I was going to... What are before, my habits? Before, yeah, what are your habits Oof. daily? Well, I, I actually stand up when I'm on calls, right? That's one. Um, I, I have a, a habit. I don't know that it's a good one, which is I fly all the time. So I'm on the road most of my life. I say mm. I live on an airplane. So I typically feel like I've wasted time if I don't show up and they're calling my name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't recommend that for other people who don't like to live on the edge. Right. But, you know, habits are... Um, uh, what time do you wake up in the morning? Let's start with that. Seven. Seven. With or without an alarm clock, seven. Do you drink coffee? No, never did, which I got to tell you, I promise you is just because I'm so stubborn and my big brothers bet me that I would start drinking coffee in college. I said, how much? And I, th- I think they named like a decent dollar amount. So I never drank coffee. Really? Yeah, just for them to pay me. Right, just for them. <laughs> no, I, I got I, But I, I will I tell you, I drink, I drink iced tea by the gallon. You do. Oh yeah. So that's your that's your thing. That's just my icing. thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think you came in with a nice. I did. No, yeah. It's like my binky. Does that? It is like your binky. <laughs> so do you wake up? What's the first thing that you like? What do you eat for breakfast? What do you like to eat? What don't you eat? I like, typically don't eat till lunch. Are um, you doing intermittent fasting? Then, man, or? I just think now somebody has given it a name, and I feel very virtuous. Yeah. I really just don't yeah. ever have anything in my house. Um, so I didn't. I don't eat breakfast, but we eat together every day as a company. So when I'm in the office, mm. uh, we all get together around, we have this ginormous glass table. Um, and as the company has grown, the table just gets, it looks like the last Aww. supper at this point, it's massive. Um, but it's really been such an important tradition to me. I thought when I started my first business, like no death by meeting, I can't do it. Right. I want us to all be on the same page. So we're gonna get down, we're gonna get together and eat lunch together every day. So we do all we were talking about the business, but we're also solving, you know, reality television struggles right. the night before too. <laughs> I love that. Which is great. So at noon you have lunch usually when yeah. you're with them. Okay. Yeah. And so it's, it, now they call it intermittent, but you've always done that your whole life, kind of um, or your I don't know, my, my whole life. But yeah, I've adult never life. been a huge breakfast eater. I'm much more of a lunch. Yeah. Okay. And do you like are you is there anything particular that that you eat every day or it doesn't matter? Um, You're not really. I wish, but I'm on the road. So I think the one constant is, is iced tea always in always, the end. Just iced tea. Um, but, but not necessarily, you know, sometimes it's dinners out and in, in that. Um, I wish I was better about my, my food. I think traveling makes it more complicated. Right. It's very, um, it's, it's, it bought yeah. the way for, every, for me too, yeah. you know, like it's so, like. Yeah, for sure. I mean, habits are, look, I have animals that I love. Um, I have pigs in the backyard. I call my, our, I call our house Pink Acres <laughs> because we, it's so funny and it's really very pigs urban. in the house? No, outside. So they don't really like to come in. But Theodore and Tallulah live outside. Cute names. And like, you know, you got to go out and like pick up the pig poop. And I think that's a good thing. I have a sign in my office that say cowgirls scrape shit from your boots before entering. And I think a lot of that is like you got to do the hard work. I think that's right? great. So that's a part of the ritual. Like wake up. Animals are like a big part of the, the first part of my day. And I have a crazy little 
rescue dog who has more Instagram followers than I do, named <laughs> Lickety, who is just a doll. Um, and you know, that's the that's the happy place, right. including. I know a lot of people would say it's a terrible habit to wake up and immediately get on your phone. I reject that. <laughs> like yeah. I immediately get on my phone and it's not that I get on the phone to read the news. I actually get on the phone for um, the daily reminder of how lucky I am to be surrounded by these people in my life. Wow. Right? Yeah. Like as I like start going through all of the, you know, pictures and everything else, like I feel like I'm so fortunate. I've got such incredible women that I get to meet. And watching the pass that they're on just makes me happy as I start the day. That's nice. Oh. Do you yeah. work out in the morning or do you work out at all? Are you uh, a big evening? Like I would love to be a morning workout person. I am an evening workout person. But you work out. I do. What kind of stuff do you do? Bar is my favorite. Bar. Yeah. All right. So those are good habits. That's mm -hmm. okay. We obviously know you have the hustle. We mm -hmm. have that down. <laughs> you have been amazing. You're so inspirational. Oh, you. Seriously, not just for women, but for anybody. Thank you. The fact that you were able to uh, to grow and build and execute on this on this thing that helps so many women. Oh, thank do you know how many women are actually using your ad, I guess, ad right now? Yeah. I don't know that I could quote you the, the exact number, but... Is it in the millions or um, is it in the... We're probably not quite to the millions yet. Yeah. We, we just we just launched it um, really the, it, with advertising this year. So uh, probably most of the people listening won't have ever heard of it yet. Um, so radio ads turned on about six weeks ago. Oh, and wow. I got to tell you, I like sat in my car and cried like a baby when it went on Howard Stern because it has been 10 years to get to that moment. This is amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. So next time I see you, you're going to be like, actually, you know, now we're at 10 million people That's are right. using it. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Because I, I think awareness isn't there yet. So we're just starting. Right. Yeah. That's what you need first yeah. is the awareness, but I think, and the education. And yeah. I mean, like you said, there are so many women that people, like, you never even think about this being an actual real That's right. issue until. Ag agreed. Or, you know, just something that is, that you could possibly address. Absolutely. Sydney, you're amazing. How do people Thank find you. you and Addie and everything yeah. else? So you can find Addie at Addie.com. I'll tell you it's spelled, like all drugs are spelled a weird way, A-D-D-Y-I.com. Mm -hmm. So add your interest, A-D-D-Y-I.com. Um, find me at, at Cindy Pink CEO. I'd love for you guys to follow me. Yeah. And if you have a great idea that's catered to ladies, thepinkceiling.com. Pinkceiling.com. Thank you so much. You've been me. great. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, guys. Habits and hustle. Time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind. Don't stop. Keep it going. Habits and hustle from nothing into something. All out. Hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries. Tune in. You can get to know them. Be inspired. This is your moment. Excuses. We ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle podcast. Powered by Habit Nest.